Okay. Hey, Greg. How are you doing today? I'm good. How are you? I'm fine. Thank you. First off, thank you so much for agreeing to do this interview on the exercise squat. And before we get into the questions, um, could you briefly give us an introduction about yourself, your, your background and what you currently do? Uh, yeah, sure. So my name is Greg Knuckles. Um, I compete in powerlifting. I've, I've been training for powerlifting for 10 years now. Um, I have a degree in exercise and sports science. Uh, some of my best lifts include a 750-pound raw squat uh, that was with knee wraps in the 242 class, uh, which at the time was an all-time record uh, in the drug-tested division. Um, without knee wraps, I've squatted 725 in training, and previously before that, 650 in a meet at 220, um, which was five pounds off the all-time world record, which I didn't actually know I was that close to it. If I would have known, I would have attempted 660, but whatever. Um, you win some, you lose some. So uh, I'm, I'm a pretty decent squatter, have a, a strong educational background in exercise and sports science, uh, and I like talking about squatting. It's, uh, it's probably one of my top five favorite things to discuss. So Great. happy to be here. And you're, by the way, the squat's uh, really impressive. And I've noticed that you don't squat in uh, weightlifting shoes or Converse. You use something else. Uh, it kind of it kind of depends what mood I'm in, actually. Uh, I, I do generally front squat in weightlifting shoes. And occasion, occasionally I'll do back squats in weightlifting shoes as well. Um, yeah, it really just depends what kind of mood I'm in. And then... Um, yeah, typically though, I do just use another flat-soled shoe. Uh, they were actually just nine dollars at Walmart. Uh, <laughs> Slip-ons, and they uh, the the sole is tacky enough that it doesn't slide, and you know it's a thin sole, just like a Converse. And I think they're more comfortable. So, uh, and they're a lot cheaper. And I'm I'm rough on shoes, so uh, yeah, that's that's always a plus as well. Okay, excellent. Okay, so first question. Um, <clears throat> Based on a person's uh, anatomical structure, how do you decide which squat you should use? Um, more than anything, it's, uh, it's just a matter of experimentation and seeing what feels best for that individual. Um, so the, the, two, the two biggest factors that will determine uh, what stance you need to squat with, whether you'll probably feel more comfortable with a front squat, high bar, low bar squat. Um, the two the two major factors are just uh, limb lengths relative to uh, torso length. So um, you know if you have really really long femurs relative to your uh, torso, then um, you'll probably have to lean forward quite a bit when you squat. And a lot of those people they don't feel very comfortable uh, low bar squatting because with the bar dropped a little bit further down their back. Uh, that naturally inclines your torso a little bit more. And so since they're already uh, bent way far forward in the first place, a lot of those people, uh, they may feel more comfortable uh, sticking primarily with maybe front squats um, as their primary squatting variation or high bar squats. Um, and then the other thing is uh, hip anatomy. So um, there are a lot of just like different small factors here that add up. Uh, one is the shape of your pelvis and then where your hip socket is actually located on the pelvis, whether it's uh, a little bit farther in front or a little bit farther around the side. Um, one is how deep that hip socket is, your acetabulum. Um, a deeper acetabulum uh, makes the hip a little bit more stable, but also it limits range of, range of motion to some degree. Uh, then there's the angle that your... Um, that the head of your femur or that the neck of your femur comes off the shaft of your femur, um, that level of inclination. So uh, either normal or coxa vera or coxa valga, just depending on uh, that angle that comes off, that'll um, largely determine, or not necessarily determine, but contribute to how much you can comfortably abduct your hips. Uh, so that'll, that'll play into how wide you can squat. Uh, and then there are a few other things like... Uh, uh, rotation wise where that neck of 
the femur is coming off the shaft of the femur. So not the angle it's coming off, but uh, kind of how far around uh, the side of the femur it is. Um, and then, uh, yeah, those are those are really the major factors in hip anatomy. And uh, I guess if I guess if you just really really wanted to, uh, you could get like an X ray or MRI to look at that and say like, oh yeah, this is what kind of hip I have. So I'm going to squat like this. But really, you don't need to do that. You can you can largely figure that out uh, through trial and error. And so um, essentially, this is this is what's primarily uh, going to contribute to uh, stance width and squat depth. So some people simply have hips that allow them to go deeper than other people. So a slightly uh, shallower acetabulum, um, having uh, having a slightly narrower pelvis and the acetabulum uh, kind of a little bit closer to the front instead of more like around the side and the back. Uh, that'll allow more straight ahead uh, hip flexion. So, um, yeah, that'll determine how wide your stance should be, whether you can squat ass to grass or, you know, if you need to cut your squat a little bit higher to not allow your lower back to round. And, um, yeah, it's, uh, it's really not all that complicated. Just play around with different stance widths, see where you feel the most comfortable, uh, see how deep you can comfortably squat. Um, and then foot angle and knee angle, that's largely determined by how much you can comfortably abduct your hips. Um, a lot of people, they they work from the ground up, so they think your toes are supposed to be pointed straight ahead or out at exactly 30 degrees or something like that. Uh, but it should work in reverse. You start with your hips, so you see what your hips can comfortably do. Um, see how much they want to abduct, how much they can abduct. Uh, that's going to determine where your knees are pointed, obviously based on uh, how much your hips are abducted and externally rotated. And then uh, you want your knees to be tracking over your first or second toe, roughly. So um, once you see what your hips can do, that'll determine where your knees are pointed, and then that will determine uh, where you should point your toes. So just working from the hips down there. So um, anatomical features, just basic things like limb lengths relative to torso length. Um, that doesn't necessarily determine what type of squat you should do, but it's probably going to strongly influence it. Again, uh, the shorter your torso is relative to your femurs, uh, the more you'll have to uh, lean over when you squat, the more inclined your torso angle is going to be. Um, so the, the shorter your torso is relative to your femurs, um, you'll probably prefer maybe front squats more versus the other way around. Um, really short femurs relative to your torso, you'll be able to keep a, a, a pretty upright torso uh, regardless of what type of squat position you use. Uh, and then hip anatomy, that's going to largely determine stance width, how far out your toes are pointed, and how deep you can comfortably and safely go. Excellent. Do you feel that people try to overcomplicate things when it comes to their anatomical structure and how they actually should squat? Uh, I think so. Um, I don't necessarily, I don't necessarily know if it's overcomplicating. I just think a lot of people, uh, believe they're, um, more special of snowflakes than they actually are. Uh, and I also think that people get way, way too hung up on the details. So you could either view this as overcomplicating or maybe even undercomplicating. Um, they think that there's just one, uh, particular uh, exact way that everyone should squat. Um, and so they try to fit themselves to that mold instead of just keeping just a few basic principles in mind. So um, when I'm, when I'm uh, looking at someone's squat, really all I want to see, uh, like the, thing, the things that I want to make sure I'm seeing are uh, they don't have knee valgus, their knees aren't caving in. Um, they can maintain spinal extension and um, essentially that there's no pain anywhere and that they're getting uh, as deep as they safely can. So um, if they're cutting their squats off high, you know, they need to, they need to sort that out, uh, stop being a wimp and squat lower. 
Uh, if their knees are caving, then that could be a stance width issue. That's that's the biggest thing, just people taking a wider stance than they should. Uh, or it can just be a slight motor control issue. Um, something that can really help with that is squatting with uh, just a really light uh, elastic band around your knees. So um, just, just below the kneecap and on the outside of both knees, or on both of your knees, so uh, you have to push out against the band. Just that little tactile cue um, helps a lot of people keep their knees out if they have a tendency to cave, uh, so their knees will track over their toes. Uh, and then last thing, spinal extension. Uh, that's really just a matter of not going too heavy and then also easing people into the squatting movement. Um, and there, there are varying degrees of motor control here. Some people can pick that up really quickly. Uh, some people it takes a little bit longer, and so you may have to do uh, some progressive range of motion work with them, you know, maybe doing high box squats and then working lower and lower and lower uh, as they learn to um, maintain spinal extension and proper pelvic position. But um, those are those are really just the only three major technical things I look for. As long as someone has those in place, um, they're, they're going to have a fairly comfortable, safe squat. And at that point, they can train the movement really hard. Uh, obviously, you know, there, there are a few other little things if someone is a power lifter and they're squatting for the sole purpose of lifting as much weight in a meet as possible. But in terms of someone who's squatting for athletic development, um, you know, or they're just a casual lifter and they want to improve their squat, uh, those are really just the three major things everyone needs to uh, make sure they master um, before they really start loading the squat heavy and training it hard. And um, I think uh, I think people do tend to overcomplicate it and think that a lot more things are just vitally important. But really, as long as you can maintain spinal extension, take it as deep as you comfortably can and not have your knees cave, then you have a pretty decent squat. Okay, excellent. So the next question is, if your goals are mainly for um, muscle growth, hypertrophy, should you squat differently or how should you train the squat? Um, well, okay, so in terms of the actual programming itself, uh, pretty straightforward. Volume is king. Um, in, in just about every uh, study you'll look at that compares different levels of uh, training volume, higher volume, almost always outperforms lower volume. There were uh, there were two studies that compared three different volume conditions that I can think of right off where they had uh, what they termed low, moderate, and high volume. And the high volume condition in both of those studies were uh, quite frankly absurd. Um, <laughs> like levels of training volume that uh, you know, you may, you may find like a couple just super obsessed power lifters or weight lifters that are pushing that far. But, uh, for the most part, just ramping up training volume, more hard quality sets over the course of a training week. That's, that's the main training thing. Harder. I mean, it's pretty straightforward. The more effort you put into something generally, the better results you get. Uh, same thing with squatting. Um, in terms of technique, the biggest thing is just squat depth. Um, again, it, when you look at the scientific literature, generally longer ranges of motion produce a better training effect than shorter ranges of motion. So um, if you can squat ass to grass, that's fantastic. Uh, take a squat really, really deep. If you don't have hips that allow you to do that, or maybe you have uh, limited ankle mobility so your knees can't track far enough forward for you to get really, really deep in the squat, just going as deep as you safely can every rep. Um, and that's really about it. So, uh, it, it, and I mean, you can boil both of those things down to effort. It's harder to squat deep than it is to squat shallow. It's harder to squat high volumes than it is to squat low volumes. So in general, if it's harder, you should probably do it and it's going to make your legs bigger. Okay. Any, anything you want to mention on stance, foot position, techniques you should do if you want to uh, recruit more of the quads uh, instead of the, the glutes and hips? Uh, actually, there. I, I'm glad you asked that question. There's less involved there than I think most people realize. Um, it. I think it does mainly just become an issue of depth. 
Uh, and the reason for that is um, the reason for that is twofold. One, uh, th this is a somewhat technical point, and um, if if anyone wants to read more about this, I suggest they pick up a copy of uh, oh, what's it called? I think I think it's called Biomechanics and Motor Control of Human Movement by Winter. Uh, it's whatever biomechanics textbook was authored by Winter. Uh, he he discusses this in a lot of detail, and it's quite understandable. Um, but with the hips and knees, people have a tendency, um, just because it's much, much easier to just think about it uh, two-dimensionally. So, uh, you know, if you're looking at the squat, you're just looking at it side on. You're looking at how far the hips are behind the bar, how far the knees are in front of the bar. Um, looking at the moment arm between center of mass and then the hip joint and the knee joint. And... Um, just making calculations from there, like, oh, how hard is this on the quads? How hard is this on the hips? When uh, really you need to be calculating those things in three dimensions, which can change the calculations uh, pretty substantially. Um, Escamilla, uh, Raphael Escamilla from Duke, um, had some work on this, both with the squat, looking at different squat or uh, different stance widths, and also the deadlift, um, looking at conventional and sumo and how much... Uh, analyzing them in two versus three dimensions, how much that changed um, the outcomes when looking at the torque required at each joint. And um, basically those studies showed that when you just look at things in two dimensions the way most people do, um, that skews the results pretty substantially. So uh, when, when you understand knee and hip extension occurring in three dimensions, um, kind of the, the offshoot of those studies as Camilla did, uh, is that stance width really doesn't matter nearly as much as most people tend to think, either for squats or deadlifts. Um, and then the other thing is understanding the role of biarticular muscles in force transfer. So your hamstrings and your rectus femoris, uh, they're what you call biarticular muscles, so they act at two joints. So the hamstrings are hip extensors and they're also knee flexors, and the rectus femoris is a hip flexor and also a knee extensor. Uh, that's in contrast to uh, monoarticular muscles like the rest of the quads. All they do is extend the knee. They only cross one joint. Uh, or the glutes, all they really do. Eh. If you want to get into like how they attach to the IT band and tie into the lumbodorsal fascia a little bit, you could get a little bit more complicated. But for all intents and purposes, all the glutes do is extend the hip. Um, monoarticular muscle. So um, what those biarticular muscles do is uh, if you're maintaining tension on them, they help transfer forces from one part of the system to another. So uh, just take the hamstrings. Since they do uh, insert on the top of the tibia and fibula, uh, when the knee extends, um, that's, going to, that's going to put some tension on the uh, distal portion of the hamstring. So as long as you're maintaining hamstring tension, as long as it stays the same basic length, as the knee extends, that tension is then going to travel up the hamstring and actually help the hip extend as well, and vice versa with the rectus femoris. So what those biarticular muscles do is they really just tie the knee and hip together. And so if you look at um, the external torque, if you look at uh, just where the bar is relative to the knee and hip, uh, it can look like something is a lot, lot more knee dominant or a lot, lot more hip dominant. But really what those biarticular muscles do is they help transfer the forces between the two joints. So basically if something's uh, really hard on the hip, if the external demands on the hip are really high, uh, the quads can actually um, give aid to the hip via that hamstring and then vice versa, uh, hip to the knee via the rectus femoris. And so um, even when you compare movements that uh, look like there are much, much higher hip demands or much, much higher knee demands, um, it's, uh, it's actually not all that different if you look at muscle activation. So if you compare, uh, external torques to EMG, um, something that looks much, much more hip dominant, um, you actually in general find that, uh, quad, glute, hamstring, EMG is quite similar. And that's because of, uh, those biarticular muscles distributing forces throughout the system. So, um, Really, those two things, the um, looking at hip and knee extension in three dimensions rather than two and the role of biarticular muscles, uh, that really just builds a lot of redundancy into the system. And kind of the net effect is that um, 
biomechanically similar compound movements have pretty similar training effects. So a uh, wide stance squat versus a narrow stance squat, uh, there's really not that much of a difference. Just stick with whatever allows you the longest range of motion. Uh, high bar versus low bar, again, not that much of a difference. Just uh, when you're training for hypertrophy, just whatever allows you that longest range of motion, that's probably what's going to give you the best training effect. Um, and it's not really it's not really worth getting hung up on the details because of the redundancy built into the system due to those two factors. Excellent. Okay, let's move on to some questions on um, on footwear and equipment. Um, what footwear footwear do you usually recommend? Like, do you recommend weightlifting shoes or or, the, or Converse shoes or? Uh, really. That, that is primarily just a matter of personal preference, uh, whether you use a raised heel or a flat shoe. The most important thing is uh, you, want it, you want it to have good enough grip on the sole that your feet aren't going to slide, obviously. Uh, and you also want a solid sole instead of a cushy one. So uh, something like Converse's, um, I've actually, I actually squatted in skateboarding shoes for quite a while, again, because they have a... Oh man, they were so comfortable. But yeah, they they also have a solid sole, so people can control their skateboard well. Um, uh, and weightlifting shoes as well. They have a raised heel. It's not a flat sole, but again, it's a it's a solid sole. So it's not cushy. Uh, I it doesn't feel like you're squatting in mashed potatoes. That's that's just kind of how it feels to me when I forget to bring my shoes and I'm squatting in basketball shoes or something. Um, but yeah, in general, as long as it's a solid sole and it has um, and it, it's tacky enough on the bottom that your feet aren't going to slide. Past that, it's just a matter of personal preference. If you like a raised heel, that's cool. If you like a flat sole, that's cool. And it really doesn't matter all that much. Okay, excellent. Any other equipment you would recommend for the squat? A belt. A belt, yeah. Yep. Um, with a belt, people... It seems like a lot of people have this apprehension that squatting with a belt is going to make their... Uh, make their core weak, make their abdominal muscles weak. Uh, they think that a belt is just kind of a crutch, I guess. Um, but when you actually look at the literature, both for the squat and deadlift, uh, it doesn't actually seem like a belt makes any meaningful difference in um, abdominal or oblique activation uh, to any great degree at all. So most studies show absolutely no difference. Uh, some studies show... Uh, slightly higher activation in some muscles and slightly lower in other muscles with a belt. But we're talking like really trivial differences. And uh, so, yeah, that's that's really probably not worth worrying about. And then also, as long as you're doing um, also just like direct core training as well. So if you compare uh, like abdominal and oblique activation in any sort of squat versus really any sort of what you would think of as a core exercise. So, um, you know, planks, crunches, leg raises, etc. cetera. Um, specific core exercises in terms of muscle activation, just beat the ever loving snot out of any sort of squat with or without a belt. So, uh, one, if you're not planning on doing any core work in the first place and all you're doing is squatting, your core is probably going to be uh, it's probably going to be fine if you use a belt for the vast majority of your squat work. Uh, you're probably not actually missing out on anything by using that belt. Um, and as long as you're doing core training, that's where 99% of your core strength is going to come from, not the squatting in the first place. Uh, but there actually uh, is some research showing that squatting with a belt can uh, increase muscle activation slightly in the lower body. So, um, hip extensors, quads, uh, not to a great degree, but to some degree. And I guess that kind of makes sense if you think through it. So um, your uh, muscle activation that's controlled by your nervous system and your nervous system's priority number one is, you know, uh, let's not, let's not uh, break my spine right now. Like, let's make sure I'm not severing my spinal cord. Uh, and so when you're squatting with a belt, you can produce more intra-abdominal pressure. You can uh, support your spine better. And so then it kind of makes sense that if your nervous system feels that your spine is uh, safer and better supported, that it will then say, okay, yeah, we can, 
we can let the hip extensors and the quads fire a little bit harder because priority number one, not snap, not snapping my spine is uh, better taken care of. Excellent. Next question is actually based on, uh, you, you've recently had an article on the um, sticking point in the squat. Mm -hmm. So what is the sticking point uh, or what causes the sticking point and what can you actually do about it? Okay, so um, sticking point for the vast majority of people in the squat uh, occurs a little bit above parallel. So most people when they squat down, they can get the bar moving out of the hole and then there's just kind of a dead area um, you know, somewhere between maybe one and six ish inches out of the hole where, um, that's, if you fail a lift, that's just where you're most likely to fail, uh, fail that lift. <laughs> and, uh, the, the main cause of that is just simply, um, your knees are already fairly extended at that point. So, um, your, uh, your quads, they're, they're not taken out of the lift. Don't think of it that way. But they've uh, they've already done most. They've already accomplished their uh, most difficult role in the squat. But your hips are also uh, about as far behind the bar at that sticking point as they were in the hole, or maybe even slightly farther behind if your knees are kicking back. Um, and if it's uh, if you maybe have a quad weakness or you've just got enough weight on the bar uh, that it's really really challenging for the quads. Those knees can shift back and the hips along with them to shift more of the load to the hip extensors. And so really, uh, there at the sticking point, um, it's still very, very challenging for the hips and you're not getting quite as much out of your quads anymore. And so it's, uh, just, it's just biomechanically the weakest position. Um, it's just the weakest part of that range of motion. And that's why most people stick there. Um, the, the biggest thing people can do to help fight through that sticking point is, uh, like I was saying, um, the bottom, like from the hole uh, to about parallel, that's the hardest part of the movement for the quads. I research looking at what's called relative muscular effort. So uh, what's demanded from a muscle versus what it is uh, capable of doing, basically. Um, that it, it verifies that there at the bottom of the squat is by far the hardest part of the movement for the quads. And so... Um, Essentially, when you're above parallel, when you're out of the hole, but you're there at the sticking point, um, your quads then have a little bit more juice that they that they could contribute to the movement. So uh, what you can do is really try to drive your hips back under the bar. Um, so you're still at a point where your hip extensors are limiting you. That's what ultimately fails uh, and makes you miss the squat there at the sticking point. So what you can do is try to drive your hips back under the bar. Your knees will travel forward along with that. So shifting more of the load back to your quads, making it a little bit easier on your hips, which are uh, near the point of failing. And then once you do that, just shift your hips forward just a little bit, just an inch or two. Uh, you should be able to pop back up pretty easily at that point. Um, when people try that cue, when they try to drive their hips under the bar, one issue a lot of people have is their weight shifts forward to their toes and they may lose their balance. So to counter that, you want to drive your traps aggressively back into the bar uh, to keep to keep uh, the bar from shifting forward to make sure uh, you don't get onto your toes and miss the lift because of that. But um, yeah, just focusing on that through the sticking point where the bar really starts to slow down, uh, grinding your hips back under the bar, um, making, making it, uh, shifting a little bit more of the effort back to your quads from your hip extensors that can that can help you get on through that sticking point and pop on up with it excellent okay so let's wrap it up with the last question <clears throat> some people seem to be much stronger in the deadlift compared to the squat what would you recommend for those people so they could um, catch up their deadlift with their no catch up their squat with their deadlift Okay, so um, a lot of that is just going to be accomplished purely by practice. So um, there, there aren't any, I guess, like uh, like standardized measurements for new lifters, but just observationally, most people when they first start lifting, um, they may be able to deadlift twice as much as they squat. Mm. Uh, or even if it's not quite that big, at least, you know, 30, 40% more 
then they squat. And that, uh, that kind of makes sense when you think about it. So, you know, for your entire life, you've been picking stuff up off the ground. So, um, torso bracing patterns, uh, they're much, much more, uh, specific than I think people realize. They think, oh yeah, like if I have strong abs, strong obliques, like I can take a good deep diaphragmatic breath, I should be able to brace just fine. But, um, it's, it's a little bit more complicated than that. Um, because just like anything else, uh, specificity plays a very large role. And so torso bracing patterns are very, uh, highly pattern specific. And so for all of your life up to the point that you touch a barbell, you've probably been picking stuff up, stuff up off the ground. So you've gotten thousands and thousands of reps of basically, uh, bracing your torso for that kind of movement. Uh, whereas, you know, even if you've been squatting down your entire life, you haven't been doing it with a really heavy barbell on your back. Uh, so you just, you just don't have that same, uh, that same uh, level of proficiency with that bracing pattern. So, uh, it doesn't, it doesn't come nearly as naturally to a lot of people. Um, when you compare, uh, new lifters who are, who are just squatting heavy for the first time to really, really highly proficient lifters, you don't see nearly as big of a gap. So, um, I, I looked at the last three years of uh, IPF Raw World Championships, um, the the data for the lifters there, and instead of that really big gap you see with new lifters, with those very, very highly trained, highly proficient lifters, uh, the gap is much closer to about a 10% gap. Um, so they're de they are still deadlifting more than they squat, but they're only deadlifting about 10% more than they squat. Um, so a lot of it is just going to be remedied by getting more reps in the squat. You know, uh, the more you do it, the more uh, just naturally proficient you're going to get at bracing for that movement. That's going to take care of a lot of it. Um, another thing that a lot of people can do is uh, it's, it's not quite as specific as back squatting, but getting more reps with the front squat. It's still an axially loaded squatting movement, uh, and it is also much more... Uh, demanding on your torso musculature than a back squat is. So uh, people who just feel very, very just uncomfortable squatting, there's a big gap between their squat and deadlift, and the squat just doesn't feel natural. Uh, doing some front squats for a while um, to to uh, really challenge that bracing pattern in a manner that's fairly similar to a back squat, uh, that can help quite a bit as well. Um, but uh, and the other thing is that cue I was talking about to fight through the sticking point, uh, that that can also help uh, quite a bit. When you really think about it, most people, their sticking point for the squat, uh, where their shoulders are, where the bar is resting, um, just vertically, that's above where their starting point for the deadlift is. So um, at the point you're missing a squat, the bars actually, if you compare that position to a deadlift, that would be like starting a deadlift from roughly mid shin or so. And so uh, the hardest part of the deadlift for most people is just breaking the bar off the floor. So the squat should actually be a bit easier than the deadlift. Um, and also when you hit that sticking point of the squat, the bar is already moving. You don't have to, you know, overcome inertia to get that bar moving like you do for the deadlift. And the other advantage of the squat is that um, your knee and shin position isn't fixed. You can drive your hips back under the bar, push your knees forward along with it, whereas you can't do that with the deadlift. If your knees move too far forward, that's going to push the bar in front of your feet. You lose your balance. So um, just those basic things, just one simply time, and that is that is the biggest factor. Just getting more reps in with the squat, um, mastering that bracing pattern that you're still trying to catch up with the deadlift bracing pattern that you've basically been doing your entire life. Uh, so that's one, just time, getting the reps in. Uh, two, um, you can use front squats to help expedite that process. Um, one other movement that I found very, very useful for that is breathing paused squats. So uh, people are a little bit leery of these because, you know, when you squat, you do generally take a deep breath, do the uh, Valsalva maneuver, create that intra-abdominal pressure. Uh, so when you do these, you want to do it with a really, really light load. Um, certainly not enough that you're going to lose spinal extension, but, um, 
it's like for me, I, I squat in the sevens. I very rarely do this with more than like 225. So you really don't need much more than about 30, maybe 40% of your max to do this. Um, but you can just squat down with that deep breath and then in the hole, maintaining spinal extension, you exhale uh, fully, forcefully, and then deep inhale again. Just repeat that for 10 to 20 breaths. Uh, what you're doing there is... Um, one, that forceful exhale, that's that's going to um, activate a lot of those muscles that are producing intra-abdominal pressure. Uh, if you've ever, like, blown up, uh, people don't do this anymore, but back in the day, uh, a mark of a strong man was being able to blow up a hot water bottle, like, just expand it to where it would pop. Um, I wish people still did that. I think that was just super cool. Uh, but that's off topic. Um <laughs> But yeah, when, when you forcefully exhale, you can feel all of those muscles contract. And also when you think about it, the, uh, the two main things that are contributing to that spinal stability, that uh, core bracing pattern, is the intra-abdominal pressure and also uh, just the contraction of all of those torso muscles that help support the spine. So when you uh, exhale, when you remove a lot of that intra-abdominal pressure, that's going to um, cause those muscles to then contract harder to compensate for that loss of intra-abdominal pressure. Uh, and then just as you repeat that, inhaling and exhaling, uh, that's going to basically get you, just get you reps in that pattern, just ingraining that bracing pattern that you need uh, to support your spine in a manner that's very specific to the squat. So uh, one, just getting more time in under the bar, just more practice squatting heavy. Two, front squats, breathing pause squats, two movements uh, that can really help a lot with ingraining that bracing pattern. And um, then three, that tip we were talking about for getting through the sticking point, uh, that can help uh, quite a bit. Um, not necessarily for building uh, proficiency with bracing patterns, but uh, that point where people do miss the squat, you can, uh, you can make that a little bit easier uh, using that cue to get your hips back under the bar. Okay, excellent. All right, Greg, that was, that was awesome. Thank you so much for taking the time to do this interview. I know you have a lot of great in-depth articles on your website. Could you please tell us where, we, where people can find these articles? Yeah, it's at uh, stringtheory.com. Uh, and so it's a mashup of strength and theory. But there's only one TH. And instead of like string theory, like in physics, it's spelled with an E instead of an I. Uh, you only get one chance to make your business name a pun, and so I had to go for it. Yeah. Uh, so stringtheory.com is my website, and that's uh, that's where I post almost all of my articles. Excellent. I'll put a link in the description below the video. Once again, thank you so much, Greg, for taking the time, and uh, have a nice day. Thanks, man. You too. Thanks for having me. Thank you.